feel very called to become a member of the Catholic Church. Love the Catholic Church. It's just the best place to be. From the studios of EWTN, this is Open Line. In North America, call toll-free 1-800-585-9396. That's 1-800-585-9396. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. You can also send an email to openline at EWTN.com. A tremendous Thursday to each and every one of you. Welcome to EWTN's Open Line Thursday, talking the new evangelization here. Father Larry is not available today. He is uh, out in uh, sunny California. And I'm coming to you live from sunny Florida here at the 2018 Legata Summit at the uh, Ritz-Carlton here in Orlando, Florida. And uh, fear not, we have a more than familiar and a more than capable substitute for Father Larry. Deacon Harold Burke Sivers is in the house. If you've got a question about the new evangelization, the number's 1-800-585-9396. That's toll-free anywhere in North America, 1-800-585-9396. If you're outside the United States and Canada, we'd love to hear from you, like maybe Portland, Oregon. Is that outside the United States and Canada? (laughs) Might as well be. What did you say the motto is in Portland? (laughs) Keep Portland weird. There you go. If you're outside the U.S., the number is one two zero five two seven one two nine eight five, and we'll put you straight to the front of the line at one two zero five two seven one two nine eight five. You can send us an email, open line at ewtn dot com, and um, the regular team is in place. Rich Jesse producing the program. Your call screeners, Mr. Matt Gubensky and Jeff Burson handling our social media endeavors. And as I mentioned before. So you're a deacon of the Archdiocese of Portland, is that right? Yes, I've been ordained uh, just over 15 years now. You know, and I and and, and you're you're Irish. I didn't realize that. <laughs> well, I went to Notre Dame, so I okay, could claim well, a little bit go. of Irish. There, there you go. That's what I and meant. So. Yeah, we, it's the first time in all the times we've been together that we discussed how you met your wife, and yep. you both went to Notre Dame, but that's not actually where you met. Yeah, we met uh, a couple of years uh, afterward uh, at a wedding yeah. uh, in Seattle. <laughs> so, although I was living in Jersey at the time and she was living in Connecticut and um so we started dating and and uh, but she's originally from Oregon that's where she wanted to go and settle down and raise kids so that's why I'm out there and she did a great job evangelizing you clearly yeah. <laughs> well convincing me to go out there because I never imagined in my life that I'd live anywhere other than Jersey you know because yeah. for us Philadelphia is the west coast <laughs> so <laughs> how'd you do in Indiana brother uh, well, Indiana was a was an interesting experience. You know, I never lived anywhere but Jersey up until that point, and to experience especially the winter. In fact, the fr- our freshman year, it was the first time I ever heard anything on the emergency broadcast system. <laughs> you, you know, you usually hear beep. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. only a test beep, right? But then uh, our freshman year, there was a, a cold weather system that dropped out of Canada. The high for the day without the wind chill was twenty below. Yeah. With the wind chill, it was 60 below, and they had a warning, like, don't go outside, that kind of thing. Yeah. And that's the first time I ever heard anything on emerging broadcast <laughs> system. So. Oh, unbelievable. We're talking the new evangelization on EWTN's Open Line Thursday. You know, we're here at the Legata Summit, uh, Deacon Harold, and we were talking about the new evangelization, and we were talking about the importance of realizing that everybody needs Jesus and everybody needs the Word of God, so we need to be evangelizing to everybody. And when you think of these CEOs around the country, you don't think of evangelists, but these wonderful people have taken on that mantle seriously, and it's really an important sector uh, of people that need to know our Lord. Yeah, if you think about it, uh, these individuals that are attending this summit are individuals that can make a major impact into culture and society because of their influence and because of the positions they hold at companies. So, so think about this. Imagine putting a Catholic ethos into your workplace environment without making it Catholic. You know what I mean? Right. So, for example, um, the, the, the primary tenet of, of human dignity is looking at someone and recognizing that they're made in the image and likeness of God. So when you're developing a human resources policy or you're developing a policies for how to enhance your employee's performance, those principles are in the back of your mind as you're forming and shaping the people who are, who are producing and making money for, for the company. You know, so so it's not just looking at people as widgets, not looking at people as assets. You know, you're looking at them in God's image and likeness, and there's a dignity there that needs to be respected. And I think 
uh, events like this, you know, where these individuals can uh, bring that into their sphere of influence, I think can have tremendous um, repercussions in the life of the church. And not only do we talk about the way that these folks can take the message out to other people, but you can't give what you don't have. And there's wonderful opportunities within the organization and here at the summit for their own personal growth and spiritual development. And that's probably what you're here for. Yeah, exactly right. And, um, you know, I'm going to be talking about divine mercy, you know, God's incredible power, divine mercy. We're talking about my dad, uh, which many of our EWTN family members are, are aware, well aware of my story because EWTN played a huge role in, in my dad's conversion and the reconciliation in our family. So uh, that, that cannot be understated. So I'm going to share that because uh, many times in our lives we get stuck. We, we're, we're slaves to the memories of the past, to the hurts of the past, to the pains of the past. We cannot take our relationship with God to that next level. So I'm going to talk about how you can get past that, especially with the, the pain that I experienced in my home growing up with my dad, but then how uh, others can overcome that in their own lives so they can deepen their intimacy with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his church. You know, we talk with Father Larry frequently, uh, week after week, about not only uh, methods and, and uh, you know, the way that you can approach the new evangelization and the various methods that can get you started and getting the word out there, but what Father Larry stresses all the time, and you just touched on it a little bit there, is, you know, all of us are wounded. And we all have our guard up in one area or another. And people who are not familiar with the word and are not familiar with the love and mercy of our Lord that you're going to talk about, are never going to hear a word we say unless they know we love them. Yes. And what did our Lord tell us? That's how you, they will know you, is by the way you love one another. How important is it that you impress upon all the people that you talk to that you've got to love folks? You know, Jack, one of the, the, I get the great honor and privilege of traveling all around the world speak. I have, I have uh, five uh, countries that I'm speaking in this year alone. And one of the things that saddens me on these trips is I meet people all the time that don't know how much God really loves them. And to me, that's sad and that's tragic. And, and here's the, the, the great thing about the Catholic message. Now, we all know that the, the word gospel right, means good news, evangelium. Well, if you, if you do a little study of that word, a little etymology, in the, the, the Greeks used the evangelion. So, for example, if you look at the 8th century B.C. at Homer. He used, they used that word evangelion, evangelization, uh, like uh, when they came back from battle. Hey, we have good news. We won the battle, right? But if you look at how the Romans used it at the time of Christ, evangelium, which is, sounds similar, um, it was the news that uh, Caesar proclaimed. So it wasn't just good news. It was life-changing news. Life-changing news. So that's what the gospel is. That's what the evangelization is. It's life-changing news because the, 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 our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his teachings and the love with which those teachings are given, because even St. Paul says, Ephesians 4.15, uh, the, the faith in, in uh, the truth in love, but it has to be the truth, but it has to be done in love. So it goes back exactly what you're saying. So it's, it's how people are receiving the message of love and mercy. But if, unless we're evangelized ourselves and are completely sold out on that message of love and mercy, then we can't, like you said, we can't pass that on to others, the life-changing news of Jesus Christ. Oof. Deacon Harold just getting it cranked up here on an open line Thursday. The number is 1-800-585-9396. It's toll-free anywhere in North America. one 800 585 9396 Open Line Thursday with Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. Father John Ricardo. When you and I wake up every day, do we strive to know Jesus or not? Quick question to you and me right now Is that what you and I are doing every single day? The leading Catholic voices are on EWTN Radio. EWTN is now on Twitter. Get short, timely messages from EWTN on your computer or cell phone. It's easy to stay up to date on a wide variety of topics. Pro-life news, Vatican announcements, catechesis, apologetics, the latest EWTN programming, and more. You can link to EWTN on Twitter from our homepage or go to twitter.com slash EWTN. At work, at home, at school, and on the road. Stay connected to your world with EWTN's Twitter page. Have you heard about Church Pop? Church Pop features new online Christian content that's fun and inspiring every day. Find it on Snapchat, Instagram, and on the web at churchpop.com. 
Living the Beatitudes with Father Bjorn. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. While purity is an important virtue, a lot of times we can confuse this beatitude for discussion about sexual morality. To be pure in heart is to be completely focused on and in love with God. God has given us an invitation deep within us to share in His own divine life. But it's important that we choose to focus on Him and respond to that invitation. In a homily on the Mount of Beatitudes in 2000, St. John Paul the Great says that, We are called to have an urgent response to choose between life and death. In one of the earliest known Christian documents on morality, the Didache, it says there are two ways, one of life and one of death. And between the two ways is a great difference. God has called us to be focused on Him and His love. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. EWTN. Live Truth. Live Catholic. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question or comment, call 1-800-585-9396. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. That's right. We've got a couple lines open at 1-800-585-9396. Grab one of them now. It'll be busy later, I promise you. Our leadoff hitter today is Anthony in Riverside, California, watching us on YouTube today. Anthony, you're on with Deacon Harold. Uh, hello. Um, my question is, Is um, what is the meaning of suffering when united to Christ? Okay, yeah, great question, Anthony. Thank you. Um, uh, when you look at uh, Christ's suffering, and one of the things that he was doing, he was praying from the cross. And uh, one of the things that we see uh, is in Psalm 22, for example. If you look at Psalm 22, which is written like 700 years before Jesus was on the cross, uh, you see it says, um, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay, now people would read that and say, well, well the Father abandoned Jesus on the cross, but he didn't. You have to read the rest of the psalm. To see, there were two reasons why Jesus was praying that psalm. First of all, uh, he was praying it because, if, again, if you look at the rest of the psalm, it's, a, it's prophetic. They tear holes in my hands and my feet and lay me in the dust of death. I can count every one of my bones. These people stare at me and gloat. They throw dice from my clothes. That's all in there. So the first thing that Christ was doing was saying, this psalm is being fulfilled in your hearing. The second point is this. Uh, Christ was praying that psalm because in his human nature, because remember, he's divine and human, that hypostatic union of a divine and human nature without any confusion, change, separation, or division. But in his human nature, he was allowed to experience on the cross that emptiness and that isolation and that desolation that we've all felt when we are going through something really difficult and we feel that God is not there. Obviously, God is always there, but sometimes when we're going through something hard, we feel as if God isn't there. So Christ was praying that psalm also to show us that, um, that, that death that he was going through, that suffering is not the end, is not the end, and that when we are going through something difficult, that's why for us as Catholics, we have Christ on the cross. We have crucifixes instead of just crosses. Of course, we know Christ is no longer on the cross, right? He's seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. We know that, but most of life is the cross. So when we look at that cross, we see that sign of hope. We see that sign of if Christ can endure that suffering for us and for the sins of the world, we can unite our sufferings to that suffering of Christ. When we feel when we're going through something where we feel like Christ, that God is not there and present in our lives, we can look at that crucifix and say, yes, Jesus did this for me. Jesus uh, experienced the same thing that I'm experiencing right now. But we know that that is not the end. That when we, with, when we unite our sufferings to the sufferings of Christ, that is ultimately going to lead to our, to our salvation. Because there is no resurrection without crucifixion, right? There's no Easter Sunday without Good Friday. And um, the, the scriptures are very clear about that. And uh, for more information on that, Anthony, uh, St. John Paul II has a wonderful document on redemptive suffering. Um, and so I would uh, highly recommend uh, that document as well. Suffering in and of itself is worthless, but it doesn't have to be that way, does it? That's right. Well, that, that's why we see that in our culture today. I mean, that's an important question that Anthony asked because think about it. Uh, our culture views elderly 
people as basically worthless. When you get old and you get sick, you are a burden. You are a burden to your family. You are a burden to the healthcare system. You are a burden to society. So we got two options for you. We'll kill you. That's euthanasia. Or we'll give you medication to kill yourself. That's assisted suicide. But you see, it's, it's not... See, we, look, we have a culture today that says that um, it doesn't look at the value of the person because of the suffering. But we have to look past the suffering to see the value of the person, the dignity of that person, despite the fact that they are suffering. So it's not about avoiding suffering that's meaningless. It's about finding meaning in the suffering that's unavoidable. 1-800-585-9396 is our toll-free number. That's the number Ann used. She's in the Florida Panhandle listening on Guadalupe Radio. Ann, you're on with Deacon Harold. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. Good afternoon. Go Good ahead, afternoon. Ann. Um, I have a difficult family um, and difficult um, sibling, brothers and sisters. Um, my mother was alcoholic. I was the oldest girl, so I took care of a lot of things that she didn't, and then when she got older, I tried to take care of her and was in touch with her, but she spent she spent a lot of time um, lying and saying untruths about me, like I wasn't contacting her, I was trying to put her in a home against her will, things like that, and my siblings um, don't contact me anymore. They um, think I'm just this terrible person, and I send them cards and try to get in touch with them on Facebook and texting, but they have no contact with me at all. And now that my mother's gone, my siblings are gone too. So it's kind of difficult. How do I, um, how do I reach past um, the past and get into a relationship with them? Oh Welcome boy! Welcome to the human condition. Yeah, right? I tell you, and I wish you were attending my my talk. That I'm giving here at the summit because that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about, uh, a- answering your question. Um, the, the, the thing is this. Uh, I, like you, have had painful experiences with, with one of my parents, my dad, in the past. The point, Ann, where um, uh, I did not speak to him for 18 years. And when, oh. my, when, my, when my kids were young, when they asked about their grandfather, I told them he was dead. That's how much I, I hated my father. Now, um, now, we, they, we did come to a reconciliation before he died uh, uh, two years ago, um, but, and it, but, but it was not easy, okay? So I'm going to give you kind of a, since we, I can't go fully into it right now, I'm just going to give you the thing. Uh, first of all, you have to recognize the fact that you have been hurt. Don't try to hide it. Don't try to not feel the, the anger and the frustration because some people suppress that, but it will always come back to bite you. Okay, so don't ever do that. F- allow yourself to feel the pain of your experience of the hurt. Uh, second, recognize the fact that uh, uh, that the past helps shape you into the person that you are today, but your past does not determine your future. Okay, your past does not determine your future, and because your mom is dead, you know there there may not be uh, an ability for reconciliation there. Um, but one of the things you can do is when you reach out to your brothers and sisters, just tell them that you love them. Just say, you know, I, I am asking you all to forgive me for anything I may have done that caused this rift between us. You, you see what I'm saying, Ann? Now, look, that's counterintuitive because you said, wait a minute, they're the ones that did this to me. I didn't do anything to them. You see, that's not the point. Christ asks us in that beautiful divine mercy image, you see the rays coming out from his heart. We are to be vehicles of mercy to others. And that opens them up to receive the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so you're trying to be a vehicle of mercy to them. So as as difficult as this may be, Anne, to ask your brothers and sisters to forgive you for anything you may have done to bring about this situation because, and one last thing I would say, uh, think of the story of David and Goliath, right? Uh, This situation with your siblings is the Goliath that's in your life right now. Now, what did David fight Goliath with? Not with the weapons of man, but with the weapons of God, right? He used that sling and those, and those five smooth, what I call the sling and the five smooth stones, right? Which is, which to me is a type of rosary. You know, the sling and the five stones, the five stones represented the five wounds of Christ or each of the five joyful, sorrowful, luminous and glorious mysteries of the rosary. So fight 
with this Goliath in your life uh, and with the spiritual weapons of our faith. And uh, the Lord will open up the depths of his mercy and his love to you. And, you know, by, by being that vehicle of mercy to others, by being vulnerable, as the Lord was vulnerable on the cross and made a complete gift of himself, when you do that toward your siblings, that opens them up to receive God's mercy. And then, uh, God willing, they'll reflect that mercy back to you when they're ready, when their hearts are ready to, uh, to receive everything that God wants to give them. Is that helpful, Ann? Yes. Yes, it is very much so. Thank you so much for um, that information, and um, God bless you. Thank you. God You're bless you, welcome. and we appreciate the phone call. 1-800-585-9396 is our toll-free number. It's toll-free anywhere in North America, 1-800-585-9396. Next stop, Olympia, Washington, up in your neck of the woods, Deacon Harold. Linda is in Olympia listening on Sacred Heart Radio. Linda, you're on with Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. Hi, how are you today? Doing well, thank you. Well, Good. Um, I want to thank you for taking my call. My question is that, first of all, I know we do need to pray for the poor souls in purgatory, and I know that I understand they could pray for us, but I'm just curious as to why they can't pray for themselves. Okay. So we know that the the, the three states uh, that were in our journey towards God is the Church of Militant, which is the church here on earth. There's a church suffering, which is a church in purgatory. And there's a church triumphant, which, of course, we all hope to get to living our life face to face with God forever in heaven. Now, um, when the souls are in purgatory, because remember, if someone's in purgatory, that means they're going to heaven. <laughs> it's, just, it's just like a car wash. you know. Sign, start, sign me up, baby. Little, little cleanup on the, way to, uh, on the way to heaven. I mean, Mother Angelica say all the time that when she, she's going to jump for joy when she's in purgatory because she knows she's eventually going to get to heaven. Now, uh, we pray for those souls in, in purgatory um, uh, because those, I mean, remember, pur- purgatory in a sense is not a place. We, I, I think as human beings, we kind of think of it as a place, but it's more like a state. It's more like, a, a, again, a, a state of transitioning. Those last, um, those last uh, uh, imperfections. imperfections and those desire to hold on to sin and that concupiscence is purged so we can stand before God face to face with uh, souls that are clean before him. So we, so we pray for those souls in purgatory to help that process of purgation to go through as quickly as possible. They can spend the rest of eternity um, in the beatific vision before God. But uh, they can't pray for themselves uh, because when they're in that state of purgatory, they are the receivers of prayer, right? So they can pray for other people, but for themselves, they need the prayers of, they need the prayers of other people. Um, and so, uh, so we pray for them. Like, for example, we don't need to pray for people in heaven. Why? Because they're already there. <laughs> there's, no, there's, no, there's no reason to pray for someone who's already in heaven, right? Because they're, they're there already. But, but the, the, the souls in, in purgatory uh, can pray for others, but we, they need our assistance and our help uh, and our prayers and to, to have that, uh, that state of purgatory hopefully pass as quickly as possible. They can spend eternity with, with God forever. It's not anything that, they, that they've done that prevents them from praying for themselves. But when you're in purgatory, it's not about you. It's not about yourself. It's about purging those last vestiges of holding on to sin so that, so that uh, they can um, have life forever with God. Just like you can't, you know, uh, go to confession without a priest, uh, you know, it's the same thing. You, you, you don't just pray f- to yourself or pray for yourself. Uh, we need the prayers and assistance of others. And so uh, that's how I, I would uh, answer that. Is that, Does that helpful, make, that make sense? Yeah. Okay, yes. Thank you. Well, thank you, Linda. We appreciate the phone call. That frees up a line for you at 1-800-585-9396. It's toll-free anywhere in North America, 1-800-585-9396. How amazing. How amazing would it be to have no urges to sin whatsoever? Yeah, uh, I I don't know if that's even possible. I mean, but I mean that's kind but, of a definition of heaven, huh? I mean, yeah, it is. I it is. Well, you don't even it. desire because you're, you're you're so uh, uh, close to God and living in His. You just don't even have a desire for anything but God. 
You know, that's just awesome. I look forward to that. <laughs> you and me both. Again, the number 1-800-585-9396. It's toll-free anywhere in North America. 1-800-585-9396. Rather, if you're outside the United States and Canada, we'd also love to hear from you. Your number is one 205 271 2985. That's 1 205 271 2985. And we'll put you straight to the front of the line. You can also send us an email. Email us at uh, openline at ewtn.com. We're also available on the EWTN YouTube and Facebook sites up on Facebook Live. And you can put your question in there, and Jeff Burson will float it our way. Deacon Harold Burke Sivers talking the new evangelization, sitting in for Father Larry Richards on EWTN's Open Line Thursday. Join Doug Keck and Father Joseph Mary Wolf live from San Francisco's largest pro life event as the faithful take a stand for the unborn and all who suffer after decades of legalized abortion in the United States. Support life this January with EWTN. The Walk for Life West Coast, Saturday afternoon, 2.30 Eastern on EWTN TV and radio. There are some saints and martyrs who were beheaded with a greater peace than I have when someone cuts me off on the freeway or my teenager's running late for school. If I find someone's driving me crazy, the problem isn't that person, it's me. Whenever someone disturbs your inner peace, your inner life is too disturbable. Jesus showed us in the way to Calvary that no one can take your hope, your joy, your peace, or even your love for them. No one can make you act or feel anything. When Jesus reigns in our hearts and minds, we don't hand over that kind of power to any human being. So if you're letting someone drive you crazy today, Maybe God's telling you to build up the interior castle of your heart so that nothing disturbs you. But that comes from prayer. As St. Paul wrote from prison, do not be anxious about anything, but in prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Then the peace that surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This is Chris Stefanik from reallifecatholic.com on EWTN Radio. The wisdom of Mother Angelica. Have you ever been so grief-stricken and so heart-sick that you can't see God? You can't see God in the tragedy. You can't see God in that cross. You can't see God in that sin. Why? You're enveloped in that grief. You're enveloped in fear. And God is out the window. You don't see Him standing right next to you. EWTN. Live Truth. Live Catholic. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question or comment, call 1-800-585-9396. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. You know, Deacon Harold, it's great to see you. When we normally do this, you're in Portland and I'm in Birmingham and we don't get to see each other. That's right. Well, it's so, always good to be in person. And so, and so now I know how you feel about me because when you talk about all these vices, you like stare a hole through me. So I can't. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. I made that up. 1-800-585-9396 is our toll-free number. Next up is Nikki. She's in Harlingen, Texas, listening to EWTN on Sirius XM Channel 130. Nikki, you're on with Deacon Harold. Hello. Hello. Hi. Go right um, ahead. I have a... Oh, thank you. I have a Methodist friend who was formerly Catholic, and uh, she's no longer Catholic because her mom, she gave her a bad taste of it, and uh, she told me um, that she does not want to receive communion at all. She doesn't believe in that, and that she feels a priest has no business hearing her problems, and as a Catholic, that's very hard for me to hear. And I didn't know how to approach her. What would, what would be the right words to tell her? Because she's a young person trying to find God, and I don't want to come on too strong and scare her away. Okay, so are you asking about the confession by going to a priest or Eucharist, or, or which, what, like what point do you want to try to reach out to her on with, with regard to Catholic faith? 
Um, well, I guess I, I don't know why she feels the way about not receiving communion. Like, cause to me, I know that that is the body and blood of Christ. And so in my heart, I feel, well, she's denying God. So I don't want, I want her to be saved. And I don't know how to, to tell her. I don't know the right words to say. Yeah. Okay. So uh, there, there's a couple of things I would say. Well, first of all, you know, um, what your uh, mom is going through is um, not that different than a young person who may have gone through Catholic school, may have gone through confirmation, may have gone through all this stuff, and then, you know, and, and then they leave the church when they're in their early 20s. And you're, you're scratching your head as a parent saying, what happened? They went to Catholic school. They, they went to youth group. They got confirmed. Why are they part of the church? Because there's a disconnect between the teachings of the church, what the church actually teaches, and your everyday lived experience. So a lot of people, and it sounds like this is the case for your mom, have received the head knowledge, but it hadn't, hasn't made the transition from the head to the heart. So that the things that we believe as Catholics does does not become part of our everyday lived experience. So here's what I would say, first of all, about, for example, for mass. Um, two, two things. First of all, the way I like to think about mass is like uh, like an athlete. OK. Oh, this is a, a young friend of, your, of yours. OK, this is perfect then. So um, uh, those of us who are athletes in high school or college, you have to go to practice. Now, what's the main purpose of practice? Uh, in practice, you do the same drills and practice the same skills over and over and over again. Because what are you trying to build? Muscle memory. Because when you get into the game, not just practicing the game, you don't have time to stop and think about what your body is doing. So you have to train your body to respond to the situation that it finds itself in, either on the basketball court, volleyball court, or ice hockey, whatever. Now, um, Mass is practice, <laughs> and in Mass we do the same things over and over and over and over and over again. We receive our Lord Jesus Christ in word and in sacrament because we're building spiritual muscle memory because once practice is over, Mass is over, we have to go back into the game, into the real world, into the world outside the four walls of the church where we're being told that faith in God are for weak-minded people that need a crush to get through life. We're being told that babies in the womb are not human beings, uh, that they're just blobs of tissue. We're being lied to by the culture. So in order to combat that, we have to build that spiritual muscle memory to go out into the game of life and, and to win. Um, so what the Lord do is he's feeding us with his word and he's feeding us with his life, those sacraments, to prepare us to go out there to, to, do, to do battle for our faith, to do battle for the Lord in, in the world. So maybe making that analogy since she's young, you know, to make that analogy uh, might work for her. And the other thing is, think about this with, when it comes to the Eucharist. Um, when I was in Australia, I ran into an atheist. I, I gave a talk at a university in Perth, Australia. And after the talk, an atheist approached me and, uh, you know, told me he was an atheist and stuff, but he, he kind of liked some of the things I had to say. And I, I asked him what he taught. He said he teaches Greek. And so I asked him if he had Greek New Testament, which he did, and he brought it for me. And we looked up Luke twenty two nineteen. Now, Luke twenty two nineteen says, you know, which is just says, this is my body, this is my blood. I said, can you tell me what's going on in that sentence? And so he looks at it. We're looking at it in Greek. So he looks at the sentence, and it's, so he says the subject of the sentence is making absolute identification with the object. So what he means is that the person who's speaking, he's using the demonstrative pronoun this in order to make a connection between the object that he's holding and himself. So I said, let me be clear. Um, can you read that and say it's a sign, it's a symbol, it's just a metaphor, it's just... He said, absolutely not. I said, let me be clear again. If the person had their own arm, their own leg, their own you know, heart in their hand. He said, that is me. That's what that means? He said, yes. I said, how can you get a different meaning from what you just told me? He said, the only way you can get a different meaning if you read your own meaning into the text. <laughs> you see? So, so they're looking at the text. That's what the text says. Now, he, now, as an atheist, he doesn't believe what Jesus says, right? But he's just reading what it says. Jesus is saying clearly and unambiguously, this is my body. This is my blood. Why is he doing that? Because he's giving us his life. He said, my flesh in John 6 is my flesh is for the life of the world. And so he wants his life in us. Now, in Leviticus chapter 17, there was a prohibition against drinking blood because the blood is the life of a thing. And God is in charge of life. The only person that could touch the blood was the priest. 
But because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, he's now saying, drink my blood. Why? Because he wants his life in us. He wants his life in us. So I think um, if we make those, if you help make those connections between what we teach as Catholics and the everyday lived experience, how do we take the sacramental life of the church and apply it to our everyday life? I think she'll open her up to, re- to start looking at those connections and start seeing the Catholic faith as not just a bunch of teachings and laws, but how they connect us to reality of God's love, immense and incredible love for us, and uh, how we live that out every day. We're going to stay in the Republic of Texas. Gino is in Corpus Christi, Texas. He's listening to EWTN on Guadalupe Radio. Gino, what's your question today for Deacon Harold? Yes, Hello. Hi, Gino. Go right ahead. Deacon Harold, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you for calling. Thank you for taking my call. I'm such a fan. I, I can't even. It's hard to put into words. I've been trying to get through to you for such a long time. All right. First of all, I think you're, you're beautiful. You're awesome. Um, look forward to your YouTube videos and, and your book, Behold the Man. Oh, read it every day. Awesome. <laughs> oh, thank you. So my question is this. I'm a practicing Catholic, obviously, and um, I have a couple of roommates who are, um, how could you call them, secularized? They don't, they don't have the faith that, that us Catholics have. So they brought up a question to me the other day is, how can you go to a priest when they're, quote-unquote, just molesters? And they're all molesters, and how could you look up to somebody like that? So my question to you is, how do you defend that? What's what's the correct way to go about that? I know what the answer is, but how do I tell the non-practicing, the non-believers, the correct the correct way to go about that? All right. Well, here's here's what I would say because I, I get this question often from people: How can you come to a Catholic church that has child molesters in it? Well, here, here's my response: When I was in campus law enforcement, okay, I was a chief, and just say one of my officers pulled over a woman for speeding, right? And he asked for driver's license, registration, proof of insurance. And when he goes to the car, he notices that the woman is quite attractive. And so instead of giving her a ticket, he uh, makes a, uh, an inappropriate proposal to her to, if you perform this act, you can get out of the ticket, okay? Now, she's highly offended. She's angry. She comes back to the police station. She forms a, 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 files a formal complaint against the officer. I suspend the officer pending an investigation. Somehow it gets leaked to the media. Now everybody finds out about this, and everyone that hears about it is enraged and angry, and rightly so. Why? Because this officer who was charged and who had the duty and responsibility of upholding the law himself violated the law. Okay? So now with your next... Would your next thought then be, I will no longer stop at any stop signs. I will, I will speed as much as I want. I will not follow any laws because of what that one officer did. Your answer, is, of course, is no. So why do you do it to the church? You know, uh, th- th- we're talking about less than 2% of all the priests were ones that were accused of either, um, uh, they were either pedophiles or they were active homosexuals who were acting out. That is the truth. We're talking about less than 2% of all of the priests in the world. So it's not every single priest. Um, And the other thing to remember is Jesus had 12 apostles. One of them was Judas, who betrayed Jesus and then hung himself. So, you know, uh, even amongst the apostles, they weren't weren't perfect. There's going to be people who are going to betray the Lord. Um, but, But you have to focus on the teachings of the church and not so much the people in the church who are sinners. All of us are sinners in need of God's mercy. All of us fall short of what Christ asked us to do, which is why he gave us a sacrament of reconciliation to bring us back into that proper state of grace. But to say that all priests and molesters shouldn't look up to him is ridiculous because that, that, that statement is not true. Um, and plus, again, you have to focus on the teachings and not the people. That well, makes sense? Absolutely, Doctor. I mean, Deacon Deacon Harrow. That's that's what I was thinking. I just didn't know how to go about that. And I was wondering if I had time for just one more quick question. Sure, Gino. <clears throat> what what is the the Catholic Church, or what's the thought process on um, marriage proposals in front of the monstrous and like a, a quiet adoration with not a lot of people around? Is that something that is allowable, or is it something that 
should not be done. Proposal to a oh, a you mean a, a, ma- a marriage proposal? Oh, okay. Well, you know, um, that's yes. a great question because I actually have a couple of friends who actually proposed to their fiance that way. You know, um, okay. I, they didn't do it though. They didn't do it during adoration. What what happened was in the two cases that that I am aware of. They went to adoration together as a couple, which is something that they were doing anyway. And once, uh, and then this was the, this was a perpetual adoration. This was just a, an adoration time in the church. And once the um, the priest had done the uh, the, benediction. the benediction, and then the, the divine praise, once that was over, and, the, and the, the host was proposed, that's when he that's when they proposed he, the, the guys proposed to their fiance at that point. Right. So, but during it, during it, adoration. This, this Right. This is yeah. I mean, I think being, I think proposing. Yeah, I think proposing in church is a beautiful thing. But if you're talking about perpetual adoration chapel, I think that's a little bit different. If you went to adoration and then went outside of the room and did the proposal, then but doing it in adoration when there may other people that are there that may be worshiping, mm, I, I I'm not. I don't think that's necessarily not allowed. But I think that might be inappropriate. Um, because they're, it might be disturbing the prayer of other people who are, who are also uh, trying to be before Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Does that help, Gino? Yeah. So this is, this is a right. chapel that you can go in and go in to behind the altar and flick a little switch, and then it's, you expose the uh, um, Christ in the, in the monstrance. So this isn't during an adoration ceremony. It's just a, a chapel that you can go in and do it privately. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, in that case, that that wouldn't be a problem for a proposal there. I think that's actually beautiful to propose before the Lord. You know, I think that's because you're saying I want Christ to be the heart and center of our relationship right from the start. Right. When we get we, we initiate this, this uh, be, the kind of the beginning stages of planning our life together, having Christ be the heart and the center of that, I think is a beautiful thing. 1-800-585-9396 is our toll free number. You're a deacon assigned to a parish. Is that right? Yes. Right? Yeah. And I'm sure you understand the importance of getting the word out to people within the parish about things. And EWTN, I'm sure, is something you would love for your parishioners to all be a part of. Yeah, absolutely. And you listening today could help be a part of that. If you don't have uh, a missionary in your area, we have EWTN media missionaries all over the country that are responsible for getting all the free information that we provide for them out into their parishes. If you'd be interested in doing something like that and sharing in Mother Angelica's mission, just log on to EWTNmissionaries.com. That's EWTNmissionaries.com. Shannon's watching on YouTube. She says, is the Catholic Church considered a denomination? Uh, that would be no. And, and here's how I would respond to that. Uh, I was getting off a plane last year and I, you know, I always wear a crucifix, but in fact, the one that I'm wearing now is the one I normally wear when I travel. And, uh, I was getting off the plane and a woman said, Oh, that's a beautiful cross. And I knew when she said cross, she wasn't Catholic. And I said, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And she asked what denomination I was. And I said, I wasn't any denomination. I'm Catholic. And she looked at me. I said, she's like, I don't understand what you mean. I said, well, what are you? She goes, I'm Anglican. I said, oh, so Henry VIII founded your church, right? She goes, and she looked at me, well, what do you mean? I said, well, let's take a look at it. Luther, Martin Luther founded Lutherans. John Calvin has fo- fo- uh, founded the Calvinists, uh, the, the uh, uh, Calvinism. Um, Ulrich Zwingli founded the Reform Movement. Um, uh, Mary Baker Eddy founded the, the Church of Christian Science. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard founded Scientology. Joseph Smith found the Mormons. I mean, you go through all of these, they, they, they can trace their origins back to a human founder. But when you look at the, how the Catholic Church started, Jesus says three times in Matthew's Gospel he came to found a church. Three times he uses the word church. Which church was that? What church existed in the year 500? There are no Lutherans in 500. There are no Lutherans in 1,000. No Calvinists in 1,100. I mean, the only church was the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Uh, the church founded by Jesus Christ himself, who is God. Um, and so we're not a, a denomination. We're the common denominator. Beautiful. 1-800-585-9396. Still time for your phone calls. Um, well, I've got a question for you, Deacon Harold, and if I can scroll to it, I might even ask it to you. But it's another viewer on YouTube. And, well, if... Technology is wonderful when it works, you know? And when you get cooperation from your 
compadres back in Birmingham, Alabama. But uh, George is on YouTube, and he says, Hi, Deacon Harold. Should I plan on giving something up for Lent? Am I failing to evangelize if I don't give something up, considering someone might ask me, what did you give up? Yeah, I think that the idea of giving up something for Lent, um, because Lent is a, is a, is a, a penitential season, and so uh, giving up something, uh, em- in a sense, empties us, and that reminder of the emptiness shows that, that the, own, the, the, the deepest desires of our hearts can only be filled by Christ. And so that missing that thing, whether it be, um, you know, some people say, well, chocolate and stuff. I mean, Jesus died on the cross. We should offer him more than chocolate, right? Maybe you don't watch your favorite television show, you know, for, during Lent. Or you give up, like, you know, uh, something that you love or enjoy doing for that time to show that you're willing to sacrifice that and empty yourself of that because ultimately that emptiness in any aspect of our life can only be filled by the love and mercy of Jesus Christ. And Lent is a very powerful reminder of that fact. So I think giving up something is a very, very good thing to do because it reminds you that you can only be ultimately filled by Jesus Christ. 1-800-585-9396 is our toll-free number. Margaret's in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, listening to EWTN Radio today. Margaret, you're on with Deacon Harold. Margaret, are you there? Margaret. All right, let's put Margaret back on hold, and we will get to her in just one moment. Again, that number is 1-800-585-9396, toll-free anywhere in North America, 1-800-585-9396. You know, you started talking a little bit about uh, uh, giving something up for Lent, and when we talk about the new evangelization, this held true for the old evangelization. As we talked about before, you can't give what you don't have. Talk about the importance of individuals forming themselves in the faith, you know, to really bolster any evangelistic effort that they might engage in. Yeah, that is incredibly important. Um, and one aspect where I find that particularly important is with parents. You know, because so many times parents will drop their kids off at, f- at first communion class or confirmation class, and the kids are getting this education, uh, but the parents don't even know the basics themselves. So when the child goes home now, and, and you know, they, they've learned this stuff, the parents aren't asking, hey, what did you learn, and, and that kind of thing. And, 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 and a lot of times the kids don't see the things that they're learning being lived out at home, you see? And so when they, when they, when they notice that, that disconnect there, then for them, it just what they're learning becomes an academic exercise. It's not important to my parents. Why should it be important to me? So I think learning and, and knowing and growing in your faith helps you not just to become a better Catholic, but also become a better a parent. And I think that permeates into every aspect of your life because now Christ is not just something in your head. Christ is something that has kind of taken over your entire life. And you're living from that heart and that center and that core. And what I realize when I study the faith is the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. And that just fuels my desire to learn even more. Um, so I think people should pray for that. I mean, and, and use their time wisely. For example, gap time. Right. Like when you're driving your car, what are you listening to in that 20, 30 minute drive? Or if you're taking the, the, the train into into the office, what are you listening to during that time? Are you listening to good Catholic apologetics or uh, EWTN, any programming that's going to help you grow in your faith? Learn that little piece of knowledge of your faith to help move your heart closer to Jesus. Or are you listening to talk radio or sports? You see. So how do we use our time to bring ourselves closer to God? I think finding those gaps in our time and filling that with the, with the Lord is, is the way to go. Let's try Margaret one more time in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Margaret, are you there? Yes. Yeah, go right uh, ahead with your question. Hello? Go right ahead with your question, Margaret. Uh, I said, where did evil come from in the first place? Okay, very good. Um, evil, if we look at Genesis chapter 2, we see that, that, that man was put into the garden to till and to keep it, right? So the Lord was giving man his mission, his purpose, his uh, calling was to serve, protect, and defend everything that was entrusted to him. When God placed him in the garden, he put a tree there. Now, the, the tree, there, there's a twofold purpose for the tree. One was a physical manifestation of God's authority. It was a reminder to the man that even though he was placed in charge of creation, 
that he is not in charge of God. So that was a physical reminder from God that I'm God and you're not. But we see that the tree was not just any tree. It was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the word for knowledge there is yauda in Hebrew, which means to experience. Uh, you have to experience something in order to know it. Now, the tree itself was not evil. The tree itself, because everything God creates is good. So where did the evil come from? When man uses his free will to say no to God's invitation to love and to life and to intimacy and communion. And the way that was shown in Genesis chapter 2 is when he took the tree, he took the, the fruit off the tree and ate it. Even though God said, don't take the tree, don't take the fruit of the tree. When man, when man uses his free will to say no to God's invitation to love and life and intimacy and communion, that's where sin comes from. See, and when that sin comes into the world, when man chooses himself over God and God allows that because uh, our relationship with God has to be a free choice, because if it's not free, then it's not truly love. You know, and so and so sin comes into the world and that and that causes a division and a separation in two ways. There's original sin, which is the. Uh, the, the loss of concupiscence, the, the loss of sanctifying grace, the grace we need to get to heaven. And that was shown by being thrown out of the Garden of Eden. And there was also uh, temporal or earthly punishments for sin. So the one we see for the woman is painful childbirth and that her husband, uh, her desire should be for her husband, but he, but sh he shall rule over you. Uh, Malshal in Hebrew, which means to dominate like a tyrant. Uh, man now has to uh, work and sweat of his brow to bring forth the fruits of the earth. They're not just given to him. So, so our sin has effects not only in our lives, but in the lives of other people as well. So that's the kind of the origin of sin. Quickly, we'll go to Jack in Omaha, Nebraska, listening on Spirit yeah, Catholic right. Radio. Jack, what's your question for Deacon Harold? Jack, are you there? One last shot, Jack, for your question for Deacon Harold. Well, what Jack wanted to know, Deacon Harold, was he wanted to know, was it a sin for my non-Catholic friend to receive communion? Uh, is it a Well, um, okay. So here, here's, here's what I would say. The, the reason you have, if he wants to receive communion, the question to ask your friend is, why aren't you Catholic? Not why can't you receive communion, it's why aren't you Catholic? What is it that's holding you back? See, the, the thing is, for us as Catholics, communion and receiving Jesus in the Eucharist is the deepest form of intimacy we can have on earth. And someone who is not Catholic cannot receive the Lord because they're not in that level of intimacy with him. So it's not that anything that the church is saying why they can't receive. They have to, and, but what we're saying is this is the deepest form of intimacy we have with God on earth. And we believe with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength that what Jesus said in John chapter 6 and what he says in the Synoptic Gospels about this being his body and blood, soul, and divinity, that and we, we receive his life into us, and that, that changes us. So, but if you don't believe that, then you can't receive. It's that simple. Like, I'm in a covenant relationship with my wife. No one else is entitled to be in that relationship besides me, right? Uh, and it's the same thing with the Eucharist. You have to be in that relationship of intimate, personal, loving, life-giving communion in order to receive God's life. So the question is, why aren't you Catholic? Deacon, thanks so much for being so gracious with your time and filling in here at the last minute. Well, thank you, Jack, for having me. I always enjoy being on EW10 and an open line. Would you leave us with a blessing? Sure. May Almighty God bless you. And keep you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Deacon Harold Burke Sivers fill, uh, filling in for Father Larry. We'll be back at it tomorrow. Colin Donovan, our Vice President of Theology, will be not in the house here in Florida, but he'll be in the house in Birmingham, and I'll be in Florida. And we'll come at you with all of your theological questions for Colin tomorrow. Until we get together then, God bless. <laughs>